to be with us for UN Radio. Uh, I'm talking to the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, and her name is Ms. Zainab Bangura. Um, just a few questions on your visit to Mogadishu. We know you're coming from Somalia. And uh, how is the situation in Somalia with regards to sexual violence? Um, thank you very much. Um, the situation in relation to sexual violence and conflicts is actually very serious in Mogadishu. Um, the reason why, because you have a huge population of IDPs who are in 513 camps in Mogadishu. And 75% of the population of these IDPs are women. And 50 to 60% of them are the households in this camp are headed by women. So you have a large percentage of women. The population of women as against men in Somalia is 60%. So a lot of these women are alone with their children, so they are very vulnerable. And the fact that uh, the militias live within the camps with the women makes it very complicated for these women. So there's no peace and security for them. And I think that's the reason. So the women are being raped at random, at will. They can't do anything about it because they live with these men. But is it not easy for them to identify the men since they, since they are staying with the men in the camps? The rape, according to the information we had when we discussed with these women, the rapes normally happen in the middle of the night. These are little camp bed things you have where these women live. There are no lights. All they know is that these men have guns. And the uniform of police, officers and military, you can buy it in the markets. So it's difficult for the women to know whether it's a police officer or it's a, it's a, it's a soldier. In any case, if you have a camp where you have over 30, 40,000 people, you can live in the same camp with the person, not in the same area. So it's difficult to tell. But even if they know, the fact that these people have gone and they live with them, it's going to be impossible for you to pinpoint because you know he'll come at night and shoot you. He can kill you. So it's not possible. Now, after you speaking to the women, what do they think they can be helped? How do they think you can help them? Well, the, the first important issue I think um, which we have been able to address is that the government has the political will to address this issue. So one of the things that the government is trying to do is to relocate these women. At the moment in time when rape takes place, a woman is raped where she feels her life is under threat, what the, the, the organizations are doing is to relocate her to another camp. Well, she goes there, the militias are still there. So sometimes the women refuse to move because they're in the midst of families and friends. They don't want to go to a place where they have to start all over again. So it becomes difficult for them to move. So the government is, has identified three locations where they want to move these women, where they can provide adequate security and to ensure there's accountability. At the same time, we're working with the police to be able to make sure they actually improve their investigation capacity and working with the judiciary to improve their prosecution capacity so that the police can be able to investigate when the case is taken and the, the judiciary can prosecute. And at the same time, one of the things we discussed with the UN agencies yesterday is how to try to support the government to have a proper legislation. Because you have to make it a crime and people have to be punished. And I think that's what we're going to do. I heard you talking about their traditional system of uh, looking at this issue. How are you, how is it going to be helpful and are you, is it going to be put together with the legal system or how are you going to use it? Because if they believe in it, they will still want to go there. Well, I think it's a matter of trust, it's a matter of confidence, it's a matter of awareness raising, you know, and sensitization. I think all, any victim who has been raped wants justice. The reason why these women are going to the traditional justice system is because the, the, the state justice system had not existed. Had not existed. So they had no option. They had to deal with the cultural just, traditional justice system. But once you build, you improve on the, on the, on the uh, national justice system, and the women really see that people who are raping them are held to account and they are punished, I'm sure they will respond to it. That's all I believe.
I know you're also coming from DRC, which also has a problem. And I think there was another special uh, representative before you. Have we moved forward as women? Uh, where are we? Has it helped this office? Is it helping? Well, in the case of DRC, the first thing we did was actually develop a comprehensive strategy, national strategy. And I think that has helped country because it has helped to bring the partners together. It has also helped, they have a very strong gender minister and she's very committed. And I think when I went to the DRC, I saw a lot of changes because I had a long discussion with President Kabila. He did accept that it's a problem. He did accept that efforts are being made. He did agree that the efforts are not very effective, but we need to do more. And I also addressed the speaker of the parliament. I met the president of the Senate, and all of them have committed to join us. So the political will has improved considerably. We have been able to break the culture of denial in the DRC. So now it's affected. President Kabila said to me, yes, I agree that military people are committing sexual violence. We're trying to hold them account. But the people who are committed are the people that are integrated into the army. So from now on, I'm going to make it a policy. I'm not going to integrate into my national army anybody who commits sexual violence. I mean, that's very good news for us. So we've moved a long way. And as I said, the religion, everybody now in the DRC knows that they need to change the narrative. That DRC has a lot to offer other than sexual violence. So people should not talk about the DRC and talk about sexual violence. So they have done a lot and I was amazed because I traveled um, in the east. I spent five days in North, in North and South Kivu and then in Oriental. And I went, I met victims. It's still a lot of problems because you have those militia who don't understand anything. And I addressed the military. You will be surprised when I address a brigade of soldiers. They said to me, yes, it's been sexual violence has been committed. The only way we can turn with this is to make sure that we end impunity. Anybody who commits it must be investigated, must be must be prosecuted, and must be sentenced. Which was a shock to me. Do they have monitoring uh, mechanisms? Yes, we do. We're putting it in place. The UN. I'm also deploying a women protection advisor in the DRC because you know the mandate has been changed. Yes. So the UN is also putting the issue of sexual violence at the center of the new mandates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.